short piece on what I'm going to call the manifesto for complex systems. This is to give just a really hopefully clear, simple framing about what we're talking about here, which ultimately is really modern science. Oh, I'm in the wrong spot, so I'm going to... Okay. All right. So let us talk about things. Let's get on the right object. The usual team. So I'm just going to give a simple definition for complexity. I'll kind of come back to that. And then this one page manifesto for you know, why this is a re why all of this makes sense here and now. So a big part of it will be just how science has worked and, and necessarily worked if um, would work if we were actually to be successful. So reductionism, we have to figure out all the small pieces because they're real and they exist. Quarks, maybe. Okay, but all right. And then the manifesto. So that is, and the, the symbol here is the, the shovel because ultimately what I want to say here is just get on with it. You know, do modern science. Don't be stuck in tiny little bracketed disciplines. Even if you are really a specialist, you need to know about other areas. Right, so the word complex is a good word. Um, so made up with folds or weaves, right? So it's some sense of intricacy. And you know what? I'm, I'm happy to sort of look at the etymology of some of these words in, that we use and, and feel that we can be at peace with them, right? We don't have to go to something more. You know, they, might, they won't be dug up and sort of thrown away later on. They may, but I don't think they need to be. You know, there are previous terms here like cybernetics and so on, which are sort of branches of what we might think of as parts of complex systems. It's not a great term. Um, so I think this is a good word. Uh, systems, you know, these are these are good terms. So complex systems, we're solid. There's complicated. This is an old thing that's been talked about many times. Um, and and I just want to separate them a little bit. Uh, so, so, you know, traditionally a mechanical watch, you could have someone who would understand it completely, could take it apart and repair it. Um, my wife's, um, one of her grandfathers was a repairman. And you know, it's quite a, quite a skill, but it could be all in your head. You could understand it completely. Um, that was true of planes as well. Early on, mechanically, you could kind of have the whole thing in your head. So these we might refer to as complicated. Um, now, they have ultimately become complex as well, and there, there are behaviors that we didn't quite, you know, build in um, or certainly had no idea might have come out at the end. So we'll get to that as we come back to foundations of complex systems later on in the course. But ultimately, many of our engineered systems, once they're of big enough scale, um, can also be um, complex, right? So, and we'll come back to robustness and all these sorts of things later on. Uh, so we can make these engineered systems that do one thing, but they're not really adaptable, right? So we get excited about robots that might hit a baseball or clean the floor for us. But, um, you know, we can ask them to try to do some other things like, you know, make the toast. and uh, not so good. Uh, or, yeah. All right. So we can, we, we, we've been pretty good at engineering systems that, that do certain things. Um, they're not necessarily then adaptable. I know the robots will come eventually and they'll laugh at this, but um, yeah. All right. So as I said, engineered systems can certainly become complex. Um, and, and the big deal we'll have in this is emergence, right? So that there is, there are behaviors, and I know I talked about this probably in the introduction, but there are behaviors uh, and phenomena at the macro scale that aren't in any of the, the parts, right? So hurricanes are not inside water molecules. So we can get to that. And power grids, of course, a famous example now, and, and you, know, you know, very problematic, right? Power going out um, for, for large populations, previously impossible, because we didn't even have power. But um, once we start to connect things up and we get to continent scales and, and, and so on, then, then these, these not just emergent good things can happen, but of course these unexpected emergent bad things. And planes have worked like that as well too. So we've seen that a little more um, recently where 
we've, we've had trouble building some of these more sophisticated points because they aren't really in anyone's head anymore and, and some things can go wrong. Okay, um, so spectacular failures are always in the offing. So you'll hear this phrasing complex adaptive systems. Now, I come from, I'm a simple-minded person from a physics background. I want to understand how things work. So I'm more general in my way of um, approaching things. So complex systems is fine for me. So fluids, absolutely complex system story. And, you know, again, something I'll come back to later in the course, but one of our greatest achievements is, is understanding fluids. And, and it's absolutely a micro to macro story. Navier-Stokes equations, crazy success. All right. So here's just a simple definition um, for complex system. So distributed system. So and there are lots of parts involved. Now, lots can be a little funny. And, and in some cases, it can be really just three, right? Because you can get emergent behavior that's not obviously in any of the individuals. Um, three, three planets, for example, can, can give rise to chaotic behavior. Uh, so, no, no, I hope what I just said is not a lie. But anyway, uh, so, so no centralized control or some limited centralized control. Certainly there can be some, um, but no dominant centralized control because then we're away from, you know, anything interesting happening. Um, of course, this is what authoritarian regimes would like or uh, people who want to dominate families or institutions or whatever it is or their, you know, high school group, right? Uh, simplifies the behavior, Leviathan. So more is different, and this is a profound piece uh, by Anderson. Let me see if I can make that all still work. Yes, this should pop up. Another example of this. Here it is. Not here. Okay, but we'll go back. Let's open another place. Uh, but this is the idea that as you go up through... Um, levels of systems and you're starting with quarks, for example, if you like, or atoms and so on, uh, you get to behaviors that are, n are not at all evident in, in the lower forms, right? So we don't very easily predict a platypus um, if we have a box of quarks on the, on, the, on the table. So more is different. So the idea is so more things, you get to different, qualitatively different behavior. So there's a qualitative, quantitative, qualitatively different behavior, right? A hurricane is a this swelling is a different thing. It's not, you can't look at a, uh, an atom and, and see it. So there are other pieces, and, and that's all I want to say, right? So they could be networked, but just uh, they're, they're interrelated, they're connected in some way, and there's going to be some emergent behavior. And, and the, our ability to describe that emergent behavior, let me go back to that and just say, is, you know, that's this great challenge of science. And so there are some fields, again, like fluids, where we've been able to write down the Navier-Stokes equations and explain a lot of fluid behavior. However, something like turbulence, where it gets where the equations break down, you know, we get into trouble. And my thinking there is becomes more, more in the realm of algorithmic behavior. You know, so evolution is full of algorithmic behavior. Social phenomena full of algorithmic behavior. The economy. Um, and we'll come back to that when we talk about stories. So, okay. Uh, there, there can be this kind of explicit nonlinear relationships, you know, that can be uh, kind of come out of the fact that, that, uh, that, that there's some network um, connection between individuals that so might not be manifested at that, that level, but it could be explicit, um, you know, little feedback loops, right? These are things that people have thought about for a long time now. Um, open or driven, so that means that there's energy coming into the system from the outside and, and being taken out. Um, these are, these are all possible parts, but I, I'm not saying they're necessary. Memory, you know, most systems we become, that we're worried about and interested in, uh, you know, there's a lot of memory. I mean, the Earth has memory because you know, it's still here uh, from one billionth of a second ago. So there's just memory of the state you're in, and then there's memory of, you know, back in time, like you know, our memories. Things get a little timey-wimey for us. And we have work on that, which I might talk about later. Uh, modularity, and so that's, this actually does seem to be uh, uh, something that's observed over and over with uh, real systems, particularly evolutionary created ones. And, and 
engineering ones can work in that way too. Um, but there's some modularity to it. Okay, so even software, for example, right? There's sort of some core pieces that are used over and over again, and they become parts of bigger and bigger systems. Um, so a huge amount of work has gone into. Uh, let me see. I don't have my gloves on. That's a problem. A huge amount of work has gone into uh, taking enormous networks, right? So enormous amounts of. Um, data where we have lots of little individuals that interact with other individuals. We have all of that and it's too much to put in our own minds. Um, hundreds of millions of nodes with you know, maybe 10 to 100 interactions per node with all the other nodes. You know, what, is, what does that look like? Right? You can't just go splotch and put it on the, on the wall. People do that, but it's not great. So a lot of effort there to, to figure these things out. And, and we'll talk about that if you've worked with networks. I'm sure you've um, come across that. Community detection or um, uh, is is one framing or structure detection. Yep. And I touched on this before, but the mechanisms involved in complex systems go from being purely physical, right? So there's you know, the astrophysics. We have all this very interesting, uh, beautiful structure, right? Um, galaxies and so on. Um, and there are all sorts of things about information being at the bottom of all this. But you know, this is sort of a raw physics story. Gravity, it's a big deal. Again, something we'll touch on later on. But I would think as we go up through these scales, um, you know, the emergence of life, the emergence of um, you know, interactions between you know, species and organisms and so on and ecosystems, uh, then what, what I'll call socio-technical phenomena, um, people plus information systems, computer systems, connecting systems, more and more we see algorithms come along. Right? Language is full of algorithmic behavior, uh, social interactions, algorithmic behavior, economic, you know, the way organisms interact with each other and make decisions. You know, Pratch is full of little algorithms in his head about eating food, um, watching things that he might want to eat, thinking about how to eat them. So, I mean, maybe it's a simple set, but you know, they're, they're interesting. So, Complex systems, uh, there are some classic ones, right? So ant colonies are, are classic ones, uh, cells, uh, the ways um, other kinds of social insects work, ecosystems. You know, we've, we've, in all these different fields, we've struggled with thinking about them, measuring them well. Again, a big point we'll come back to, measurement is the you know, foundation of science. Measuring them well, understanding, trying to understand why they don't fall apart in the first place, right? That, that's kind of extraordinary, how they've evolved to be where they are. We've certainly gotten the systems that are, you know, kind of, it's kind of amazing they, they, they got to that place. But we, you know, we were able to trace back through evolutionary history, you know, the origins of eyes, the origins of um, ants or whatever it is, you know. And so these are, you know, interesting problems. Forests, super interesting um, developments there in the last, I think, 20 years of trees being connected to each other through root systems and through um, fungal systems um, that are little highways for nutrients and so on. So there's a lot more communication in, in forests uh, than, than we've um, seen before. So complex systems are everywhere. And you know, if we think about right now with the pandemic, you know, this, is a map, this is, involves um, biology, right, with viruses, the actual virus itself. There's the human behavior on top. There's all the technological stuff in terms of um, you know, how we move around, you know, the achievements we've made with flight and so on. So that, that has connected us. Then there's the socio-technical connection of everyone talking online and, and sharing news and so on, and, and we end up with people behaving in very different ways. And uh, well, if the virus was a uh, virus was a um, you know could think it'd be sort of steepling its fingers um, with some of the decisions we've made for sure. But you know to try to respond to this and to do it well, you need a you. You, know, you need to really be able to think about systems. You need to think about what, if I put this policy in place, we put this policy in place, you know, how do we do it well? How do we um, help people you know, respond in ways that, that save each other? Because it is, this is something where the, the individual narrative fails. Um, it's very much a system story. And all these, all these fields, and I like to think about uh, fields going from data scarce to data rich. This is just a natural progression of science. Um, 
you know, physics was like this, right? We could look at the stars, but we didn't have uh, telescopes. And then we got telescopes, and then we got arrays of telescopes. So in about 2000, astrophysics changes from being this, you know, sitting out somewhere, maybe in Hawaii, it's all very nice, on top of a mountain, looking and hoping there are no clouds, um, getting enough measurements, to this more distributed thing where now it's a lot more computational work and so on. So data scarce to data rich, and that changes, it, you know, it doesn't change necessarily the fundamental questions you may have asked, you know, you still want to ask those questions, but you, you'll be able to probably think about other questions as well. So uh, it's just a natural progression. This I'm just going to throw up here, and you could you could uh, dive into it if you want. But it's an interesting little uh, interesting attempt to uh, trace the history of people who've been thinking about um, complex systems. So you know, there's some straight up fra framings back here: system science, um, Bateson from ecology, uh, Margaret Mead, uh, Rapoport was very famous for um, tit for tat in uh, the uh, Prisoner's Dilemma game. Newton gets thrown in there as well because dynamic, dynamical systems is enormous. Uh, Wiener, very very famous character. Anyway, so this all, you know, this is just a lot going on here. I want to highlight, if I can, um, I should, should be in here somewhere. Uh, Juniper Lovato, it's kind of right in the middle there, yeah, who uh, is listed here at being, being at the Santa Fe Institute, but is in fact here at UVM, uh, is the um, Director of Outreach and Education for the Complex System Center and is also now a PhD student, so it's really exciting. Anyway, she's been a, a global leader in, in, um, in the education part of um, complex systems. All right, so that's a, you know, this, this is a difficult thing to, to kind of put together, but you know, hard work, right? So this is online, I'm going to pause and let you think about this, um, and you can, of course, do whatever you want. You can speed it all up, which you know, I guess I would advocate. But I have a few of these cryptographs that I've made. I realize cryptography is a thing, but crypt cryptograph, right? So it's a, you have to figure it out. So uh, there's some vertical axis and horizontal axis uh, units are unclear. You can see, if you look at this, right, there's, there's uh, one, Let's get that, you know, right. So there's, there's a one, two, three, four, five. So this, the, and you can see that it's, it is an integer thing. So there's some sort of just ordering here. Number, things are going down. We'll come to these kinds of plots um, in, the, in, in a few sections when we talk about power law size distributions. So there's a ranking here of something um, and it's decreasing. We see over on this vertical axis, right? Zero, that's a minus 10. So you can wonder what that might be. I'll pause briefly. That probably got a, that would get unnerving. Okay, so um, that's a it's a log it's a log. So I'll give you a few things. It's a log ten scale on the vertical axis, and so something is decreasing. All right, there's no way you should get this. What is it? So it's actually what's inside you and me on average, roughly. It's uh, it's by weight. Um, not count, right? So it's going to be different by weight. Uh, if you took someone and did a very bad thing and separated them all into the little the atoms that are involved in that individual, this is a, an estimate then of um, the the fraction of the body mass that is. Well, let's look at them. Uh, certain atoms, right? So oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, calcium, phosphorus. And I have on the next slide that this is about 99% of the weight of a human. So six pieces. Uh, and then these next ones are all pretty important. They get you almost to about 100. And then we have all these trace elements. And we have some stuff in there that's not great, like lead. We're not really thrilled about lead. So, so the ones in blue are um, not ideal. Some of the st stuff down here is just straight up poisonous. Um, so it's thought now, Pretty interesting thing to reflect on, and I'll have some more pieces uh, when I sort of lead up to the manifesto very shortly. Took us a while to figure this out. We made up of these little parts, and uh, they vary greatly in, in the in the number, um, in, in number and weight, different things. So, in fact, in terms of um, number, hydrogen, there are more hydrogen atoms than anything else, but uh, 
oxygen, yeah, by weight. It's a little bit of a beast, so that, that adds up. All right, so that's weird. That's, that's us. So somehow we're these things, right? But you wouldn't want to make a human out of this. And so that's what this, this slide is, right? This, was, this would be a terrible Lego set. So you hand someone 59 little um, packages, and the oxygen one is enormous, and there's one with beryllium, and it's like you have to use some, well, you have to put on gloves and, and use uh, tongs for that one. And you feel bad about putting it in there, but it's like you want to make the full thing, right? So, um, yeah, so 10 to the 27. It's not great. Um, you can get away with 29 pieces. That, that's what we think. So this is kind of remarkable. It's only really just a few years ago now that bromine was shown scientifically or agreed upon, I suppose, should we say, that, that it's an essential trace element for at least humans, I suppose, but uh, organisms in general. So if you go swimming in bromine pools, there are chlorine pools, of course, is the tradition, but many are bromine now. Um, at least certainly around here in, in uh, Burlington. Bromine, yeah. So maybe you're getting a, an important uh, vital for the day. So as I said, six elements make up 99% of the body. Uh, and then the next five will get, so it's 11 elements. Just 11, so all these little plastic bags, 11 of them. And, and those plastic bags are very different in size. Many orders of magnitude. The sulfur, but that depends how evil you are. Right, got to say that. Uh, then we believe there are 18, we understand at this point that there are 18 other trace elements that we need little bits of, right? You know, and some of these are incredibly, you know, zinc, zinc's not listed here, but you know, you're, we're really in trouble if we don't have zinc. Um, anyway, good. So it could be much worse. You could just get a box that has quarks in it, up quarks and down quarks, some electrons, and um, go ahead, make a make a, a human. So we don't really think about that. We, it's kind of funny when it comes to food. We'll come back to food at some point. We, we have on the lists of, uh, on the sides of boxes and, and, and you know, labels that say how much fat and um, you know, carbohydrates and, and so on are in. A, you know, and maybe iron will be listed and some other pieces. So we kind of go somewhat atomistic there a little bit, right? Um, but we don't talk about how many quarks are in the cornflakes. Maybe we should. So, it's best not to think of other people as some big um, combination of, uh, of very tiny pieces. We don't, we don't want to do that. Uh, so I'll read you a few quotes and then I have a, a, a counterpoint to this one. So Susan Stohelitz, so this is from Pratchett. Terry Pratchett. It was hard to deal with people when a tiny part of you saw them as a temporary collection of atoms that would not be around in another few decades. So, wonderful book. Um, she, of course, is the granddaughter of death, who's an anthropomorphic personification of the Grim Reaper. It exists because we think, or people do think, uh, such, a, such a, an entity must exist. So, there's that, but then you could also take a different approach. That's because losers look stuff up while the rest of us are carving all them DMs. Listen to your sister, Morty. To live is to risk it all. Otherwise, you're just an inert chunk of randomly assembled molecules drifting wherever the universe blows you. Oh, I'm sorry, Jerry. I didn't see you there. How much of that did you hear? All of it. You were looking right at me. <sighs> right. Okay, so... Let us sort this out. We're going to talk about, um, we'll get a quick, quick overview of, of uh, science. So the idea that, that things are made up of tiny little things is an old idea, right? So this is where the, the word atom comes from. So it's Democritus uh, came up with this idea that there, if you could peer into the, 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 the tiniest parts of, of anything around you, you would start to see that there are these little building blocks. Uh, and so atom means, so A is the, as in not, and to, to cut, right? So you can't break anymore. Of course, there are quarks, whatever. But, you know, this idea that we get down to these little pieces. Uh, not everyone was happy about this. Plato, as I have written here, wanted his uh, books to be burned, um, you know, which is a little harsh. But, uh, um, you know, 
academ academics have, have uh, obviously haven't changed really over a long period of time. So then you have the sort of development of, of chemistry and, and the, the emergence of the periodic table, which is what I have here in this little tarot card. People start to really see these element, these these materials as being made out of different things, and, and there's sort of this developing idea, and there's all this kind of pattern. And of course, we have, as I said, the periodic table. So that that takes there's a, several hundred years of that. I would say 300 years of what I would call the golden age of reductionism, and it's an enormous achievement, right? It's an enormous achievement. So we start to understand that matter is made up of these special little pieces and then what's surprising about this is um, it's only really it, it's into the 1900s before collectively we accept this and Boltzmann incredibly famous physicist you know an absolute genius um, thought that gases work like this right so he, he had a theory which was you know supposed built out of atoms and molecules these little bits interacting and so on um, Mark, who's famous for, whose, whose name is enshrined in going fastness, um, they, they didn't believe this, right? So there was a lot of arguing, and, and uh, he, he uh, I guess, would, you know, his life ended uh, terribly. Um, but, and there's some suggestion that, that part of it was his frustration with um, the people around him. So it's important that he, he passed away in 1906. So this is 1904, he's at a conference, um, where physicists didn't think atoms existed, right? That was just not true, and uh, they wouldn't let him into the physics section. He, <laughs> he was put in this rather just disappointingly low caliber area called applied mathematics. And then he had a bit, when I, I guess the story is he went on a bit of a rampage, right? So um, attacking philosophy and, and kind of using Lamarck's uh, theory, right, of inheritance, right, that you would, you would inherit things, which, of course, is true of cultural evolution um, that people inherited bad philosophy. Um, yeah, so I'm not sure if he said it was through the through the you know breeding, which of course you know these people were very much in the world of of thinking about that uh, the life that way. Um, anyway, so it was hard for scientists to overcome or philosophers to overcome the, the the bad things that had come before, and it's. It is true of science in general. We get absolutely stuck on things, right? We were completely wrong about how the planets worked for thousands of years. And uh, you could uh, get yourselves into real trouble by talking about ellipses and um, you know, the sun not being the center of the universe and all sorts of things, or the earth not being the center of the universe. Yeah, I mean, that, that could end uh, you know, terribly. You could be persecuted and, and um, uh, possibly burned at a stake. Uh, right, so Boltzmann takes his own life, 1906. Then there's this other guy who's pretty smart, probably not a great human, but uh, and and you know it's unclear as to how much of it is, you know, he's, he, he's smart anyway. But uh, had a pretty good year, uh, 1905, produced a lot of things, and um, that uh, became quite famous. And so uh, some about quantum. Um, you know, we'll Leave all that aside. But he had this little paper about, so this is Einstein, had this paper about Brownian motion, uh, the little things bump, bumping into each other. Um, could explain this idea that was observed by Brown uh, and, and named after them. And again, you should never, this is just, we'll come back, you should not name anything after people. Just, that's my personal view, bad idea. So uh, this, this, this kind of diffusion piece, and, and this is something we'll, we'll have some work on um, soon, Diffusion, when something kind of just starts to spread out and spread out and spread out, right? So if you throw some different colored liquid into a, a um, clear liquid, you'll see it spread. It's complicated how that works. Um, but this general idea, idea of idea of diffusion, and and so this short, quite short paper showed that little ball bearings kind of bouncing off of each other could give rise to what was observed in terms of this diffusion process and diffusion famously, is a Gaussian uh, distribution spreading out. Again, we'll get to that, we'll get to that through random walks. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Which might help you with your gambling, although I don't want to, you know, sort of support that too much. 
Okay, so that's, that's a theoretical piece that said, you know, it could, if, if little things are bouncing off each other, then that would give this observed macro behavior. You know, profound. And then there's uh, experimental work that's in 1908 uh, by Perrin and, and colleagues that, that showed that this atomic theory worked. So that's 1908. So it's 112 years ago, and then really, you know, in the next few years after that, that we, humans, start to say, oh, you know, atoms exist. It's not long. So when we're talking about systems, we've only just gotten to the, the small component parts, you know, the most very fundamental ones. We're still trying to sort all that out, and I know there's dark matter and whatever, and that's great for superhero origin stories and, and um, being confused about galaxies, but we'll, we'll, we'll see how that plays out. Um, but as far as we're concerned, you know, our cornflakes are made out of atoms, and, um, and uh, that's, that's where we are. So, not long ago, but then, of course, we're going to start thinking about, well, you know, how, how, do, how do systems work, right? Now, now our atoms are, of course, the atoms, but also people, right, you know, interacting with each other. So Feynman, another one of these very bright people, possibly wasn't the nicest human, but um, I mean, this, this is what's the most profound thing? If you were allowed to send one sentence along to, the, to some sort of, you know, th this is the only piece of information you're allowed to communicate, I guess you'd have to communicate how language works and, and so on. But all right, let's just say you're allowed to have sort of one core thing. It would be that atoms exist, right? That things are made of atoms. Because it took us a long time to get to that. So little pieces that are just uh, attracted in various ways, they stick together, they make molecules, da da da. Um, uh, remarkable. And so, yeah, as you said, so in that one sense, so let's see, I believe it is the atomic hypothesis that all things are made of atoms. And in that one sense, you will see there is an enormous amount of information about the world if just a little, ima a little, little imagination and thinking are applied. But yeah, Democritus was right, but. And, and probably all these other unnamed people who thought about it for three seconds or maybe years and didn't write it down. You know, we, don't, we don't know about them. Someone 10,000 years ago probably thought about it, but um, went back to you know, looking for food or something. But didn't write it down because that was not a, a thing. Or did write it down and it got washed away by the sea the next day. And or yeah, History is strange. Right, so let's have a manifesto, how things fit together. Occasionally there are postcards in this course. We're going to do it in one slide. So systems are everywhere. You can think about the systems you're part of. You can go out and look at the atmosphere. Um, you can think about water coming out of a tap, what that's all connected to. You can think about the food that you eat. Think of how all of those pieces came together to make the plate that you have in front of you. All of the origins of those things. You can think about the atoms involved. You can think about the um, particular species, you know, if it's tofu, right, broccoli and so on, right? Like how did that all get, that was created somewhere and grew somewhere and then processed and da 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 um, And then, you know, you eat it, it passes through you, it goes back in, out into the world. So this is sort of, you know, food. And, you know, and that's something, again, that we're failing to, to do well with. So systems are everywhere. They matter. Um, they're certainly not just the province of one discipline. And so science, once we've got through this period of reductionism that we had to get through if we were going to be successful, the rest of science is about how things fit together. And we get to, we have reality, right? So we have atoms. We can work with them. We can, uh, you know, try to turn lead into gold. So we have the whole alchemy thing. We, we just, that's fair enough. Like you, you try those things, right? And later on we say, oh, that was crazy. But, it, you know, I don't know. Why not? So we work with reality. But then, of course, we can start to also make our own kinds of atoms. And um, let me maybe explain that. So 300 years, golden age of reductionism. We get to atoms, start to think about these subatomic particles and so on. But DNA, right? It's even less time, genes, you know, the idea of these things. People, of course, we're aware of people for a long time, but understanding how they behave with respect to each other, um, such that we can kind of understand how systems might behave, 
you know, that's a massive problem. It's a still a huge ongoing, ongoing problem. And, and a lot of social psychology has sort of fallen apart recently. So, you know, we're really struggling there. Um, but we, we have DNA, right? Um, uh, you know, it's two, two people involved, but obviously many more people involved. And, and um, w with that, many people have involved figuring that out. But it's there now, right? We, we don't get to sort of rip that up and, and start again. I know people want to hack DNA, and yeah, but good luck. So, as I said, understanding and creating, uh, understanding real systems, understanding how we can affect them in some way. You know, we think about ecosystems, right? We introduce wolves back, or we do something that destroyed a particular species, like cane toads in Australia. You know, like we're, we're unavoidably messing with things. The, the whole fire. Um, uh, bushfire complex in, in Australia and California and other parts of the world, climate change, you know, these things are happening. How do we, uh, you know, uh, um, contend with them? What, what are, what are uh, you know, what are ways of adjusting those systems so that they are healthier, safer, better for, better for what, right? So we have to do all that too. Um, so, so we can, of course, create new systems. I mean, we've got all these things with uh, technology now, right? All these little, you know, if you think about people's phones, they're all these little magic rectangles floating around that are connected to each other. Obviously, people are sort of involved there too, but, you know, that, that's a new artifact. And it doesn't matter that they have quarks and atoms inside them, right? We've made something that is at a higher level and they interact. Um, you know, when you think about sports or music, we have rules in those that allow certain things to, to emerge. Um, right? So we, we keep playing at these higher and higher levels. Obviously government, just laws in, in general. All right, so that's the game. You know, that's what we do. That's what we have to do going here. On, we have to absolutely understand the details of things and that's going to take an enormous amount of time. I mean, biology is full of so many crazy little molecules and so on. So we're going to keep doing that for a long time. But understanding the system part and creating new systems and so on goes forever. Peace will come back to really at the end of the course and, and we'll touch on throughout is universality, right? So this is a term that comes from statistical mechanics in physics. Uh, it obviously touches, you know, would, would have evokes other, other meanings um, from other realms, but so that, so that just to say what it is, it's that you can have systems that have um, in the details, they might differ, right? They might differ. So we have milk and water, right? They're obviously in, in details different, but um, they can behave in a similar way as, as they, they flow, not under all circumstances. Um, but, you know, the viscosity is different between them. And then we can put that as a parameter into our model. But very different, you know, ingredients at the bottom, if you like. But they, they conform to the same behaviors. Um, you know, people from different cultures, to the extent that that can work, blah, 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 all sorts of things, right? So, but this is this idea of universality. And, you know, it's limited, right? We don't, we don't say everything is the same as everything. It's not, not the game here. But the fact that there are many kinds of systems that behave, you know, quantitatively in the same way at a macro level, and again, I really want to feel fluids is a sort of great example, um, means that you know th this is a fair game that we 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 aren't just studying every specific system in isolation um, and we we do have some fields that say that that's just the way it has to be like anthropology and so on like you really nothing nothing can be generalized or universalized and so on I, I mean everyone in those fields but you know that that's you know that that's certainly a point of view but in the, in the sciences where we've been able to quantify things in a hard way, and, and, and you know, people will argue that you'll never quantify culture and so on. All right. But where we've been able to do it so far, which of course is the easy part, um, we've been able to see that there are these, these um, that there's universal behavior it exists in the real world. So again, that's different micro details, but they, you know, there's some interaction that's basically similar enough that when you get to the macroscopic behavior, the, the system is behaving in the same way. And really the big deal for us is computing, right? So that 
there are a couple of pieces here. So um, one is that, of course, measurement, right? And, and that's instruments as well. But we can measure and we can store vast amounts of data. We can organize it. You know, people in um, working in neuroscience, working in um, uh, you know, like life sciences, working in linguistics, working. People are using similar computing systems now too, and, and of course the same kinds of so Python and R, right? So there's a lot of agreement across um, in, in terms of the tools and, and the way we store data. So there's a lot of at that level, there's a lot of uh, reason for people to come together and, and and talk about things. And so so that's sort of the storage and the tools we use. Uh, but of course, with computing, we can simulate. Systems. And that's that's something that's just been you know going up and up and up over time. Obviously, we do it with um, weather prediction. You know, again, that's more more measurements will help. But we also know fundamentally there's a limit. You know, we're not going to be able to predict the weather in detail. You know, really finally two weeks from now, because we understand that from dynamical systems and chaos theory. It's a very profound, deep result. Uh, but we can you know move it out a day, move it out a day. The, the, it takes a long time. But it's simulations. Um, we can simulate forest fires, but you know, often these simulations are rudimentary. And we can simulate pandemics. And I'll come back to that in this course. Many of those simulations are very basic, right? They're just very simple toy models, and, and people can kind of go too far with them. Um, but trying to simulate a pandemic spreading on the globe, sure. I mean, people are working on this, and they and we absolutely have to do it. But it has to be a kitchen sink thing. It has to be something where we know how people move around. You know, we really need the measurements to be right because you can't be just sort of making up like yeah, kind of roughly people. You know, that's not good. So there are the, again these two kinds of models: there's the toy model and the kitchen sink model, and and computers help us with both of those. Absolutely, absolutely, right? Because all the work we did before computers came along was pencil and paper, and that that actually really limited how we could think really limited how we could think uh, because we needed analytic solutions and so on because then you know how else were you going to um, see what was happening so it's it's still really early days in terms of computer simulation but uh, and, and we have a lot of arguments about agent-based models and so on as, as to the effectiveness there's definitely an art to this um, and I'll, again I kind of hope as we go through the course that I'll be able to sort of touch on um, things that have worked well, haven't worked well, and so on. But really, yeah, computational aspect of all fields just keeps going up and up. You know, there's a reason we have this term data science now that it's taken hold so well, not for everyone, but it really, you know, it really has. And computational X, you know, computational semiotics, whatever you want, right? It's, these are, these are things that, that are coming and coming, you know, along um, inevitably. They don't replace the previous work, right? Computational linguistics doesn't just sort of wipe out everything that was in it. No, it's, 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 a, and it's ex an expansion, right? So there's the core where you're able to do all the things that one individual can do or maybe a small group can do and so on and interviews and, and that kind of human-sized things. And then we're going to add to it. So that's the manifesto, right? It's, it's, it's that systems are everywhere. They matter. We can measure them now. Still poorly in some cases, of course, but uh, you know, being able to to measure them puts them into our, you know, into our gamut and 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 into our wheelhouse. And then it's not that people 500 years ago didn't think you know, systems. Of course, everyone's always thought that. Um, but we had a, a spell where we got really good at disciplines, and we had to do that. And now we have to kind of dig ourselves out of those things. And I, I feel like I've been saying this, but. Many people have been saying this for a long time, but it's still it's still the case that we are still um, happy to silo ourselves into departments and, and, and ways of thinking. So be curious, be open, be playful, um, keep looking around, looking at uh, um, fields outside of your field, and uh, yeah, read widely. Um, and, and and I think you know collectively, you know, we'll, we'll be able to advance these sciences. Uh, in, in wonderful ways. Of course, there's a huge ethical piece that overlays all of this. You know, we built, you know, Facebook, right? We have Facebook. 
good or bad, right? So you have to be very, you can, sure, we can build new systems, but we have to be very, very mindful of, of how they'll play out. Okay, manifesting.